Continuing our learning streak, we will now kickstart a panel discussion on the subject, Next Generation Transportation Technology Advances. This century has been defined by overwhelming tech-based innovations in transportation, such as self-driving cars, high-speed rail networks, gyroscopic vehicles, and more. So what's next in the industry? This session will attempt to answer that very question. I would like now to request our session moderator, Robert Thompson, Senior Systems Engineer at Zero Electric Vehicles, to come on stage and take the proceedings forward. All right, hello everybody. My name is Robert Thompson, uh, Senior Systems Engineer at Zero Electric Vehicles. We build EV retrofit kits and skateboard platforms, electrifying the future. So we're gonna talk about some of the new technologies uh, in the industry, and we're gonna be talking about how each of those technologies differ from each part of the sector in the automotive industry and transportation industries. So if I could get my panelists up here, I want them to introduce themselves and give you guys kind of a background on them, and then we'll start diving into some questions. Wherever you want. And split it up one, two. Okay. There we go. All right, you on that side? Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah, just sit down and talk. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for holding up till the end of the day on the first day. It's always a challenge. So hopefully we won't disappoint you guys. Uh, my name is Rasta Modi. I'm a CEO slash CTO of a small startup company called Vintech Nanomaterials. In my career in, in automotive and transportation started about two years back. Uh, I have 40 years experience as a senior executive in the oil and gas industry. Uh, mainly in charge of technology of a large energy company. And for my entire career, I have been involved in innovation. So innovation is what drives me uh, in terms of creating and cannibalizing your own business on a daily basis. Earlier on, a couple of speakers talked about innovation. And I think if you don't innovate, somebody else will innovate with you. So you've got to pivot and change your style. If you're a distributor, or if you're a manufacturer, or whatever you do, you've got to change it. So my background in the oil and gas industry, but I've been involved in air technology for about 15 years, uh, both in the ac academic level and uh, actually starting a group that delivered finished products in the oil and gas industry. And one of my customers used to be, I used to be one of Vintex customers, uh, the company I represent today. And when I found out I retired, they brought me in through a venture fund who said that if you hire him, we will continue with your funding. So that's how my journey started, with Vintec Nanomaterials. And as soon as I got there, I realized that uh, the distribution of the revenue within the company was kind of unbalanced. It was very oil and gas focused, and a little bit in transportation and railroads. So immediately I pivoted and switched around, knowing my background oil and gas, how cyclic it can be. And long behold, within a year, the bottom got pulled out. And luckily today we have 5% revenue oil and gas, our 85% revenue is in transportation and, and, and in rails. So we pivoted at the right time, and if oil and gas comes back, we're prepared for it too. So my main focus of talk would be how technology drives uh, creativeness and innovation in the marketplace. The biggest challenge for technology is to be known what you do. And that's a lot of challenge for small startup companies, okay? for people to understand what the products are, what technology they're offering. Unlike a software company, uh, it's very different when you're selling, selling, selling products. So I have got that opportunity to kind of bring everybody up to speed of what technology is and what can be done in the marketplace. Wonderful. Tiffany? Um, so, okay. Introduction. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'm Tiffany Daniels. Uh, I work for Jack Cooper Transport. Um, it's one of the largest over-the-road 
uh, Finnish vehicle transport companies in the U.S. Um, we move vehicles for large OEMs like GM and Ford. Uh, we've been around for over 95, 96 years now. Um, so long-standing history in the car haul industry. Um, my background is not in automotive. I'm new to the industry. Um, however, I work as the director of strategy there. And so I have a very diverse background in supply chain, project management, strategic planning, um, a lot of different segments. Um, I have worked for several companies. I used to be in the uh, air conditioning industry and I worked for a carrier um, before they split uh, from United Technologies. And United Technologies became Raytheon and went into the um, aerospace business. So I worked there. I've also worked for Georgia Pacific um, in Atlanta and I've also worked at Coca-Cola. So I have a lot of uh, different, uh, I guess I've had my hands in a lot of different industries. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's about it about me. <laughs> Great. All right, Bobby. Uh, my, name's, my name's Bobby Williams and I currently work for PKG Express. It's a transportation company. We do mostly um, driving, reefering, and flatbed loads, general freight. And I have been around the transportation world basically my whole life. My father and my grandfather were truck drivers, and they started, my mother and father started a business when I was in kindergarten. And then when I got older, I started working there when I was 18. And honestly, it's not that my industry or the industry that I wanted to work in, but I've seemed to have came in back quite a few times. So I was a CNA right out of high school and I was going to college, but then I came back. And in 2017, I came back to create a safety department and culture for the business. So I've been working on that and I'm also the um, director of recruiting as well. Wonderful. So. Now, as you met everybody, I want to start asking them the questions. Like, what kind of technologies can you think of that will impact your specific market? And I guess we can start with uh, you, Rustam. I'll be happy to. Well, let me, uh, before I get uh, too detail oriented, I think as engineers, we have to be very careful not to get too, too detail oriented. Uh, let me ask you a basic question so I can pace my presentation accordingly. Uh, how many people have heard about nanotechnology? Half the audience. Uh, do you know what size nanomaterials are? That big. Uh, that's, 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 that's too big. Too if big. you can see, that's too big. Right. Let me just set the framework, because I think that gives you a guys a little appreciation of what all is involved. If you look at a typical man, or my size at least, uh, that, that's one meter. That's a good scale. If you look at your cell phone, that's about 12 centimeters. Okay? If you look at a small ant, that's two millimeters. Okay? If you look at your hair, the thickness of your hair, I, I can help you there, but I'm, I'm, I'll just, just tell you what it is. It is 100 microns. Okay? If you look at a bacteria under a microscope, under a microscope, there's two microns. If you look at a virus, there's 20 nanometers. And if you look at the DNA, there's one nanometer. That, that gives you a size. So when I talk about nanomaterials, I'm talking about anything from 30 to 100 nanometers. So that's the size of particle we're talking about. So why is it critical for nanomaterials, nanomaterials are used in everything, everything. I got exposed to nanomaterials when I started a group called Pumps and Pipes in Houston, a collaboration between energy, medicine, and NASA, because we never knew what each other worked on, and we are the cap known as the Houston capital of these three industries. So when we start talking to heart surgeons and chemists, other people, I realized that there's a, there's a big demand of nanotechnology within the oil patch. And I learned that from Professor at Rice University, they were working on nanomedicine that can attach to the cells, the cancer cells, 
that later on they can come with radiation and just heat up those cells and kill just those cells, not all the good and bad ones. That's what happens under during chemotherapy and radiation. So that kind of opens up your mind. You start looking at different applications. So when you look at the lubricant part of the industry, the last time a major innovation was done was in 1970s, Priscilla with synthetic lubricants. Since then, really not much has happened. Different additives have been worked on, things like that. But when you start looking at nanotechnology, what my company has done and the researchers have done is they've taken not just one nanoparticle, but they've taken a hybrid particles combined together, both organic and inorganic, to provide some specific tribological benefits on application. In other words, whenever you use a particular uh, medium for windmills or for automotive, you have different characteristics, the different loadings, different RPM, different issues uh, with the application and you have certain failures. So whenever you're two moving parts, you're gonna have a failure. So our focus is at the nano level, addressing the lubrication properties of two mating mat materials. And the whole objective for us is to make sure that your assets, your like trucks, your railroads or whatever, is out there working all the time instead of being in the shop getting fixed. And one thing we have seen, the way we extended the service intervals of the, in the tracking industry quite a bit in terms of how good they were, 30,000 miles, 50,000 miles, and beyond before service intervals are needed. So because the theory is very simple. As long as you keep your assets working in the marketplace, making money, the better off you are because you have less maintenance costs. So because of that now technology, being a platform technology, we are involved in developing specialty lubricants, chemicals, protection, uh, 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 corrosive protection like paints based on air technology, and also tough materials uh, for cutting, uh, exotic materials with a nano coating. So it's, it's all over there. And recently we started adding nano coatings to stems for their dental implant to create a certain texture we can have the bone grow faster on it. And the application is unlimited. Okay, and I don't want to bore you with detail. But when it comes to the Trucking industry, I've got some specific examples I can talk about uh, after my colleagues have a time to talk about the technologies. Okay, wonderful. So let me ask you really quick. So your technologies don't just span the vehicle platform itself, but could also be in the uh, automation and the manufacturing of the vehicles as well? Absolutely. We make special lubricants for robots, uh, for robotic manufacturing, okay? Uh, we make lubricants for uh, electric vehicles, uh, uh, dielectric grease, uh, which is uh, used substantially in electrical vehicles. Our products are used by a lot of EV manufactured car, uh, automotive companies, uh, things like that. So I can, I can go down to coatings and things like that, but absolutely our focus is trucking and railroad industry. I was surprised that in the railroad industry there's so many applications. I'm not talking about in trains and uh, the luggage part of it. I'm talking about putting lubricants on the rails themselves. That was new to me. And I can talk more about in detail on that particular subject. All right, wonderful. All right, Tiffany. Um, so for my industry, um, there are a couple of things that are kind of important to us um, dealing with OEMs and dealerships and delivery of finished vehicles. One thing that um, cut out of strategic conversations that has come up is just it's speed, right? Speed to information, speed to performance, speed to service. Um, everyone wants to know where their product is in a certain uh, place in the value chain. When, when is it going to get there? Um, how soon? How long do I have to wait? And so there are things that we are working on on the speed aspect. Um, one of them is uh, enhancing our geotagging or our GPS systems to track vehicles real time on the road. Um, this gives dealerships visibility into where their, you know, their inventory is uh, step by step, almost like an Amazon package, right? When you look on the Amazon app and you look down, you know exactly where your package is. Um, when it gets however far from your house, you're able to track it all the way to the door. And so that's the concept behind the geotagging technology that um, we've been kind of 
fiddling with to see how far we can take it. Um, something else that's come up is uh, dealers um, have basically expressed interest in imaging. And so automated imaging uh, technology to enable us to not only do a good inspection on the vehicle, especially in the remarketed side, um, where you have CPO audits, um, where you're not, not only that, but to inspect for damage. So while the vehicle's in transit, you wanna see if it was damaged. Um, taking those images and sharing them with dealerships so that they can get those cars on the market faster. So if they have those images pre-done and sent to them, they are able to upload them to their sales sites while those vehicles are in transit and potentially um, start their sales process earlier. As we've stated before, um, consumers are starting to shop online now. So they're going to your website to see what your inventory is. And so if you can get the jump on your, on your inventory to be on your website, even before it hits the dealership lot, you have edged your competition a little bit and put your vehicles out there for purchase before any, anyone else does that. Um, some other things that we're kind of thinking through is um, there's a big push, uh, especially in our industry, I'm not sure, but um, going green is hand in hand with our industry. Um, thinking about green fuel solutions, electric vehicles, um, just going down that road. And so electric rigs have been a hot topic uh, when that's gonna you know, really start to replace the diesel rigs on the road, what the, uh, the transit time is gonna be, how much range it has, how far of a trip it's gonna be. And in car haul, those, those rigs are, electric rigs are ideal because those trips are short. Um, they're 200 miles maybe, uh, two, two to 300 miles each way. So we're thinking about, we're trying to get ahead of the curve and thinking about charging solutions and how to prepare drivers um, to be able to charge their vehicles in the event that there is not a charging station available. Maybe there's a portable solution that can be offered uh, for a driver to be able to recharge their vehicle in between tr uh, trips or maybe uh, on a backhaul situation. So those are some of the things that we've been thinking through on the innovation side. So with the EV charge infrastructure that you were talking about, do you see your company being in charge of creating their own infrastructure for the needs that you carry? Potentially, we are already looking at solutions to go green period. So we're looking at green operations as a whole. We're, we're thinking the, the whole nine yards. We're thinking about microgrids at our terminal locations. We have paperless efforts. We're thinking about solar power terminals. We're thinking through the entire spectrum of how we can achieve carbon neutral in a transportation industry. And it's really, it's a challenge, but it's something that you know we all across the board and in every company should be thinking through. So. Could, Potentially, yes, but I think uh, we've got a ways to go before we could do that. All right. All right, Bobby, let's have your input. What technologies? Um, well, our me. Sorry, I'm nervous. Just for the record, I don't like. I don't do this very often. Oh, you're That's good. How about some feedback? <laughs> feedback from your drivers, right? You get okay. lots of feedback from your drivers, don't you? Yes. So, I work one on one with the drivers regularly, and the problem we see is that we used to be significantly bigger than we are now. However, the driver shortage is growing significantly, and it's nearly impossible unless you're a company that has great benefits or you can hand out money for sign-on bonuses to get drivers because they know they're needed and so they can go anywhere. So, and the majority of the population of drivers is I believe it's the baby boomer, boomer generation so they're getting older. Well, they're not my generation. I grew up not seeing tech and then I was emerged into it and to them it's I don't like phones, I want a flip phone. So, they hate technology and they feel like they're steering wheel holders already, so then you throw all this tech on them, then they feel like they don't have human interactions and even though tech is coming so far in the industry and in the world as a whole, it's hard to justify it when it's still everyone's humans and we need human interaction and they're just putting their info in, they're taking pictures, then they're only calling in when there's an issue and then they feel like 
why should I be in the industry because you don't really need me. Trucks can nearly, our trucks even will slow them down when needed and we don't need, we only have Freightliners, Stoops Freightliner trucks, and most of them are 2016 and newer. However, they don't even like that, let alone the cameras in their trucks. So it's hard to get everyone on board and stay in the industry when it's merely impossible for them to feel like they have a human interaction with people because they're so used to it and their quality of living is hard. So then, like, Tiffany said the plugging in trucks or charging them along the road. Well, drivers can't even find a place to park, so then now there's no parking. So then when electric vehicles come out, is the driver going to be held accountable whenever there's an accident? Because in America, I know everyone's so happy when it comes to big trucks. So is the driver going to be held accountable, or is this machine that the company that created it and made it going to be held accountable since the driver was just there for precautionary measures and then there's going to be electrical charging stations, so then there's going to be even less parking when they already don't have enough parking. So it's just a, it's just an industry in which it's moving so fast, people's brains can't actually keep up with because technology moves at a rate in which human beings don't have the mental capacity to keep up with unless you're a tech person or like a coding person. So uh, yeah, that's you hit that right on the head for sure. Now, do you think? that because this generation uh, definition, it, do you think that is possibly slowing the advances in technology? And second to that, how long do you think it would take if that was the case for the new generation or the new thoughts of technology impacting the drivers themselves and the acceptance of these new technologies? All right. Sorry, what was the No, the no, first no. Part you, uh, no, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, how long do you think it's going to take for the baby boom era to transfer to the Gen X era and and or millennial era mm -hmm. to absorb these new advances in technology in an industry that's been around for so long? Do you see it happening extremely quick? Do you think it's going to take some time? Is this 25 years? Is it five years? What do you think? Well, mm -hmm. I know this sounds bad, but I think for them to get on board because the owner of the company I work for is my father, and he thinks like an entrepreneur, but then when you say, there's a camera in your truck, it's dual facing, well, why do I need that? and he knows he needs to have it to get a discount on his insurance and because of the standard in which the transportation industry is held to, the drivers, the company, the people that work within it, but in his driver frame of mind, he can't comprehend it because he's been driving for so long. So if he can't comprehend it and he knows all the sides of it from a driver to an owner to, I don't think that the majority of the population in that industry will probably ever be on board enough at a rate that the industry needs new drivers and for the new the millennials to come in because no one goes into driving anymore. People have, which was new to me and my sister when we were meeting with the recruiting company, new drivers now will go to school and they'll have a restriction where they cannot drive an automatic, or they have to drive an automatic, they can't drive a manual. So when you get your C class A CDL anyways, Basically, I've been told whether it's right or wrong. I haven't taken the school, but you basically just get taught how to move forward, take your test. They don't teach you how to slide tandems, how to unhook and hook your trailer like they should. So it's just like a driving test, but in a semi, I guess. So I don't think they'll ever be on the same level as my daughter's generation or me right. with tech. That's good. Um, Good insight there. That's really what <laughs> a lot a lot of that gets ignored in industry is the true consumer feedback. Everybody, you know, everyone talks about what they are capable of, but does the market even demand those capabilities? So that was excellent feedback. Um, I was going to ask you, Russell, have you had any issues with supply chain on your side? It seems to be a common factor in this industry right now that supply chain is a huge hiccup in 
the advancements in oh, our technology. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's not a day that goes by without uh, one doesn't worry about supply chain. Uh, I mean, what we face on a daily basis is uh, just the cost of the raw material right now. For us to make the nanoparticles and the additives uh, that we develop to add it to the uh, base oil or the base ingredient, the cost is soaring up quite a bit. It's not only that's availability of it. Uh, our, our suppliers are also facing that particular problem. But that's not going to change. We just adapt. Uh, I mean, that's just part of it. And we had to educate our customers too at the same time. Uh, it all comes down to communication. Communication, communication. You don't want to surprise your customers and you don't want to get surprised by our suppliers. But uh, so we encourage that particular part of it. The other thing that forces you is to start looking at alternate technologies. If, if a technology gets too expensive, it's not going to be adapted. It's not going to be accepted. You've got to be price competitive. So you have to continuously look at alternate ways of doing things, not only for suppliers, but also just alternate vendors, uh, uh, um, uh, getting materials from different parts of the world, things like that. So we are constantly in that phase. But uh, instead of sitting back and just blaming it on COVID, things are not going to change. We just adapt. That's the name of the game. People who adapt and transfer and pivot and move in the right direction, they are going to be prospering, uh, just like we did. We, we pivoted from the oil and gas industry, moved into where the business was, and was able to provide the services and the technology. And now if oil and gas comes back, great. If it doesn't, that's OK. We move on. because. Uh, uh, just to give an example, uh, with the nanotechnology platform we have, not only moving from the automotive and transportation industry, we are moving now into textile industry. We have nanomaterials right now that you can apply on a textile that kills bacteria and kills other, other uh, microbial co content. As if you look at a transportation industry, yeah, you can apply that kind of treatments in the, in the, in the cabin area where People sell a lot of fabrics and things like that. So there's always need for technology. And if you have a technology that can be applied across multiple industries, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, this is a question for Tiffany and Bobby, since you're both in the trucking industry. Are you for automation and why? Do you want an autonomous truck and a brief explanation, yes or no? I'll, go, I'll let you go first. <laughs> you can speak from the driver's perspective. Yeah. <laughs> um, do I think automation is a good idea and why? Or do I want... Do yeah, I, do you want that okay. technology? Um, personally, I'm not a tech person, but it's because, not to offend anyone who has a degree and, you know, is like an engineer, but when I call a technology company, like where we have our ELDs or something like that, I have to do research for a week and I can't do the rest of my job and I have to figure out how to do their job, but then no one knows how to do it even though I know they do, but I can't get an answer on the phone from the customer service. So <laughs> over the last year and a half, I have not grown um, a love for technology and seeing from where I grew up in technology now, it's scary because you go to the pool out there, even here with cell phones, people are in the pools with their children, with holding their cell phones, which is crazy to me. So then technology, you already have an industry where drivers, I say they're a, they're a different breed because you gotta be okay with your own, thought, own thoughts in a truck for weeks at a time by yourself. And so if they don't like technology, then how can I say, because I don't drive a truck, that it's a good idea because what happens when all the satellites go down at the same time or one goes down or the metal gets spent a half an inch more than it should and the calibration is off and they can't calibrate the ELD in a truck I call for for two weeks so I got to park it and then dispatch is like, well, what do you want me to do? And I'm like, well, we can drive to Texas and talk to the people in the office so I don't think personally that it's a good idea for this aspect of it. Do I think some of the things in technology is good, yes, because it's the world in which we live in and it's moving at a fast pace. So, yes and no. It's not like a solid yes or no. Good. No, it shouldn't be. Um, I think I'm going to 
side on the more positive side of it. Um, I agree that you know there are certain areas where it may not make sense, but I am for automation. Um, I think it's just a method of us becoming more adaptable to the way that uh, the world is changing. Um, and at the end of the day, our consumers, um, and everyone in this room is a consumer, so you guys know this, you're concerned about the speed of how you're gonna get what you, what you want when you want it. That's just human nature now. And because technology has brought us to a place where we are you know, all about instant gratification, I want to take a picture instantly, I want to share it instantly, I want to text instantly, I want to um, call my, you know, my family members, everything is instant. It's, it would be ill-advised for us in this industry to not make the same assumptions that everything that we do regarding automotive logistics, supply chain, anything transport related is not going to follow the same model. And so automation, just it's going to help us evolve with that over time and prepare uh, people like you all in this room to better do your jobs, to better inform your employees, to better support their needs, to better give them the tools and the resources that they need in order to execute effectively. So sometimes automation can be a little dangerous. I mean, I'm not sure how I feel about a semi rolling down the highway by itself. I don't, I don't think I would ever want to see that, but we may very well come to a place where we do see cars driving themselves on the highway, cars driving themselves from an OEM to a dealership, and somebody's gotta be the eagle in the sky watching those vehicles, making sure they get from point A to point B um, in one piece. Who's gonna be that eagle in the sky? It's gotta be us. Nobody else is gonna do it, right? So I'm for automation. So you would change basically your business model to Absolutely. adapt to the incoming new technology. Absolutely, I think it's going to be necessary. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, 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 some very good points, but let me just give you guys a high understanding of technology. Uh, just imagine uh, adaptation of, of a technology is like a three-legged stool. Okay. First and most foremost thing is. The technology you're creating is it going to create value. That's just one leg of the stool. The second most critical is the technology you're creating is it replacing something better than people had before. If it's not replacing something better than before, people are not going to switch. The third and the foremost critical criteria is, is that new technology is safer to use than the one is replacing. If any one of those three is missing, it's not going to be a commercial success. To give you a better perspective, look at uh, some, somebody talked about Uber this morning. Okay, that's a very good example. Is it creating value for a customer? Absolutely. I don't have to wait for a cab. I can control where, where I'm going. Where, who, so I can call anybody to come pick me up. Is it cheaper than using a cab? Yes, in most cases it is. And third and most critical factor is the safe to use. And this is where initially they struggled a lot when you had incidents of people getting attacked, raped in, in different countries. And when that started happening, people started having second doubts about the technology, okay? A cell phone was a good example. You heard about cell phone batteries exploding on people's faces. But still they overcame that and got accepted because it was replacing and bringing new value to a customer it was safe to use. So if any one of those three ingredients is missing, that'd be a problem. So coming back to autonomous vehicle, it's coming guys, you like it or not, it's coming. Okay, it's come and if you, if you don't jump on a bandwagon as an industry, or at least start getting involved in it, it's gonna leave you behind, okay? And I just like to add one thing. We keep on using the word technology. But the neat thing about technology, it's only technology if you're not born into it. Just sit and think about that for a second. Kids nowadays, cell phones is not technology to them. So they're born into it. For us it is, we didn't have it. Same thing autonomous vehicles. Three years from now, 
it won't be a technology for them because they're born into it. So just remember that when you talk about technology, it's from our perspective, from the new generation kids, they're born into it. I mean, you give a two-year-old kid, I bet he'll start programming your phone. They just wired differently. So just keep that in mind. Technology is a fast-moving thing. If you don't embrace it, it's going to leave you behind. Yeah. Sure. On that for a second, um, the thing about it is, as he mentioned, it's going in that direction whether we're ready or not. Um, we have an opportunity here to take this momentum and make it larger than just about the technology, right? This affects our recruiting. This, this affects how many people we get that are interested in the transportation industry because let's just be honest, traditionally, it's not that sexy. But we have an opportunity to make it be that way, right? And to get the younger generation to adopt it, to learn about it, to get into it, to want to be a driver because all of this cool tech is out. And I have this souped up truck and it's got all these bells and whistles and cameras and everything and I could take a selfie while I'm in it. They're going to love it. There's an opportunity for us to do so much more than just think of it as tech advances. This affects everything. This affects who we bring into the industry, who our customers are. Our customer base can widen you know, exponentially once we start to adopt different types of tech and we start to show transportation isn't boring. It's actually quite interesting. It's fascinating and it, it can be quite sexy. <laughs> Wonderful. So you actually touched on almost every point on my next question, which was, will new technology provide you more revenue, safety, or time? What is it that drives you personally towards the new technology? Challenge. Challenge? Challenge to do something better than it was before. And keep in mind, it's not a straight line. Technology is not a straight line. There's going to be a lot of speed bumps across the way. Uh, as humans, we, uh, we learn to overcome those challenges. If you just look at the space shuttle flight, the, the SpaceX, I mean, think about it. All the innovation that's been going on in the aerospace industries, it, it never happened without failure. That's just part of journey. That's about technology. It's incremental, and sometimes you see a big step change happening, but it's something that as humans, we are not going to give up. I mean, we, we're just driven with that challenge. And personally, me as an individual, to me, it just... You wake up with excitement. What, how, how am I going to make an impact today? How am I going to make an impact tomorrow? To whatever industries you serve it, because technology is what drives, uh, uh, innovation is what drives everything and that we do. But at the same time, you've got to be very conscious about the sustainability, the environment, and other things you do. Because otherwise, technology for technology's sake is worthless if it damages things around it. Do you happen to see any special needs in either of your industries that's not currently being met where you can see uh, new technology being implanted? I mean, I look at, I look at uh, every industry is so, uh, and if you look at what is the biggest destructive force in terms of equipment breaking down is wear and tear. Fundamentally, is wear and tear. When two mating surfaces rub against each other, they were wore out, they fail, and your asset becomes idle. So our goal is to provide technology to the industry that handles the wear, and, uh, wear issue at the nanoscale, okay? Because if you look at any two mating materials, uh, they look polished and finished, but if you look at a microscope, you got dips and valleys. If you look at a used oil and you rub your hands through it, you feel the fines in it. That's how abrasion happens. So really, increasing the service life through better technology, protecting another factor that's really destructive is corrosion. Corrosion protection becomes very critical, especially in EV trucks and things like that. You've got to protect all your wirings and everything from corrosion, from the environment, from the moisture, okay? So those are the kind of products we look at. Where is the pain point for our customer, our clients? Improving service life, reducing corrosion, pro providing corrosion protection, uh, improving the wear and tear of, of, of the different products. And electrical systems right now, I mean, they're very prone to corrosion because the environment has full is just moisture. How do you protect it? Uh, so I think those are the things that continuously 
improves the overall reliability of the products with proper protection. Now, I have a question about differentiation between startups and OEMs and the advances in technology and their implanting into the industry in general. Have you guys seen from either side, either an OEM or a startup being the driving force in any new technologies in the industry? That depends now when you talk about technology. Uh, I differentiate technology two ways. One's the software side and one's the hardware, I mean actual. Software-wise, you can make a lot of changes, things like that. You don't need big plant and equipment to make, make the product. And, it, yeah, and, and they get accepted much more quicker in the industry. But when you start talking about developing new products, and especially dealing with OEMs, you have to go through some rigorous, rigorous evaluation and testing. And that for a startup company is very, very expensive. Very expensive. And even after 10 years, we have not embarked into our new engine oil product because it takes a lot of capital to get it certified, which the big oil companies like Exxon, Mobil, and Shell, they got it wrapped up so well that this just certification process takes a long time. I looked at simple thing as pro providing our lubricants to the windmill industry. Um, you talk about hurdles to overcome, even though you know you have a product that will take care of the business, so we're looking at the, what is the repair market in the windmill business, um, in third world countries, where the, all that certification may not be needed to just kind of feel proven it. So of mm -hmm. course it's a big hurdle, and that's one of the reasons we try to balance it off by working with smaller customers, but at the same, at, irrespective, nobody wants to change without being tested. That's human nature. So you just have to go through the pain and do it, do it strategically where you have a very defined roadmap that you follow over time and, and be adaptable and adjust to it. It's as simple as that. I think on the OEM side, from our perspective, I'm pretty sure all of you guys know GM has formally announced their electric strategy um, with an all electric vehicle lineup by 2030, I believe, maybe before that. That is a huge, huge, huge undertaking for um, a, a car manufacturer to take on and um, just just trying to to scale that trying to understand you know this this company's mission to achieve zero crashes and zero emissions that's a very very large uh, goal and being a supplier to GM um, working with them on some of the caveats to new car designs, weight variances that will change how we ca um, haul a car across the country. Um, it's just very interesting to watch them commit to that and say it and put it in ink um, because they mean it. And, you know, Mary Barra has stood behind it. Um, she has basically said, we're going to do this and it's going to happen. So um, just watching that unfold as a supplier for GM, we've got to get our ducks in a row. You know, we've got to be prepared for that type of shift. And, and we're working closely with them on some of the, like, like I said before, some of the variances on the design of the car, the weight, how many cars you can get on a trailer, um, how, much it's, how much heavier it's going to be, how it's going to slow down uh, the transit time. Those types of things are in conversations. But it's just interesting them, to watch them make a commitment like that. So, Bobby, a question. Um, from what you said about your drivers and the inputs that you have on them, uh, what kind of aspect of the technology would be the selling point for you to integrate into uh, your trucks where you know that your user um, may not be as accepting of the new technology or not. Like, what is the sell point for you? Is safety a factor? Is it time and money that's the factor for you? What would be the driving force for you to say, okay, this is, we're, we're gonna pull the trigger on an autonomous fleet. We may only get one truck, but we wanna try a pilot program. What, what is it that's going to sell you on this new technology? 
Well, I think that we, um, our company personally, we started using camera system, but we also have a dispatch system we use, and then we have an ELD provider we use and GPS. So there's companies who have all of them and they sell all of them, but the problem is, is this company's better ELDs because it's what they do. This company is cameras because it's what they do. So then if you go with one, then it's impossible for one to be as good as the other, even though it's a package deal. So then for smaller companies or owner operators who, where I'm from, the Midwest, is a lot of the, um, a lot of people own their own trucks or they have a couple and they sign on with companies. It's hard for them to have the resources to be able to purchase these because I know for us, we're updating our ELDs to the ones that will support the new I'm sure someone will correct me, the new 4 or 5G network to hit the, when they hit the new towers, so that's good, but then they also use an app on their phone and to, for their dispatching platform, and then for me personally, safety is important because they have these CSA scores that are created by scores that the drivers get over the road. Well, let's be real, everybody's human and not everybody's gonna catch all 200 plus points that they're supposed to check on their pre-trip and if one goes bad while they're driving and then something happens, their human air is normal, so tech is great, but everybody still is human and we all have bad days. So for it to be one platform, but then that's an all-in-one fix and then there wouldn't need to be a bunch of different tech companies, so it's a hard, sell on what, I, so, and it depends on the human being, how much they want to change, and what rule and regulation that the industry, the FMCSA is gonna make trucking companies follow, because most of the time it's a hard, you're gonna do it, and you can either get on board, or there's a different place for you. So, that's my opinion on it. Talk to a few of our drivers at, at Jack Cooper and, and just the high level answer. Anything that gets a driver their load faster, they want it. If you can get a driver their load faster, then they can get on the road faster, then they make more money. That's what they care about. They don't care about um, frilly paperwork that they have to fill out or checking a lot of boxes. The faster you can get them their load, and get the product on the truck so that they can get on the road, they're going to appreciate it and love it. So if we're talking from a driver impact perspective, we should definitely focus our efforts on things that are going, going to make the drivers more money. And that's getting them on the road faster. That's getting them backhaul loads. That's going to make them optimize every trip so that they can make the most of their you know, financial situation in that position. Wonderful. Well, we've been talking up here for a while now, and I want to open it up to a little Q&A session to you guys. It can either be on something we've talked about, or uh, maybe you have a question that we haven't uh, dove into yet. So I'll leave it up to you guys. Feel free if you have any questions. Uh, thank you all. Uh, this is actually just directed at uh, Tiffany. Um, with GM converting and you know saying that they're going to move their fleet uh, to EV, um, and you being the vehicle to move those, um, are they putting any pressure on you um, to electrify your fleet as well? Not exactly to electrify our fleet, but they are now requiring all suppliers to uh, have some type of green strategy or initiative. Um, it's, and the, it's so much so that they are now giving you a packet to fill out and explain how you are uh, working on energy efficiency, how are you working on green solutions, what are you doing to reduce carbon emissions, and they are expecting all suppliers to have uh, intention if nothing else, and a high-level strategy for how you uh, plan to tackle the, the green solution. So I wouldn't say that we're gonna be in a box to be required to have electric vehicles right now. However, when they 
introduce their, you know, green fleet, they may start to apply more pressure. But all of their suppliers now are under the gun to have some kind of, of green strategy in place. Great, thank you for the question. Anybody else? Castro again, and this question is also directed to, um, I'm sorry. Tiffany. Tiffany. <laughs> <laughs> um, with the mobility of everything that's happening, and I know you mentioned Mary Barra and mm -hmm. the movement that she's making. Um, I know that they just came from a, a very good um, decade of making great sales and they were making so many cuts because they're investing all their money into tech, emerging tech and mobility and that sort. So do you think that should be a key point for other manufacturers like Mercedes, Audi, Volkswagen to follow suit? Because at that point, then they'll get left behind. Um, that's a good question. I believe uh, that other OEMs have made statements, um, but they are not as in-depth as GM, so they have not um, stated that they are gonna, going to have a completely electric um, vehicle lineup as GM has. Um, they are going to release models over time, but if you, uh, I think the few that have not, have been kind of radio silent about it or uh, Hyundai, and um, there's one other that I can't think of, but Jaguar has the complete line that they're going to release. I believe they're SUVs. Um, Ford is working on some electric vehicles as well. Um, Mercedes actually has an electric vehicle that uh, is rumored to uh, compete against Tesla and have longer range, but that's a rumor. I don't, I can't confirm that. I've only seen videos, but it's super nice. And um, so everybody's coming around. Are they going to commit to such an aggressive timeline? Probably not. I think GM is staking, is, they're putting their stake in the ground with their strategy saying, this is who we are now. We are you know, we are carbon neutral, we are zero emissions, we are zero uh, crashes, zero fatalities from crashes, this is where we're going. Whereas other uh, OEMs are probably more interested on the tech side of just having a car that'll play in the space. Um, the only other thing that I would say is it's gonna be a, a high hill to climb, being that one out of five consumers return their electric vehicles, and that's because of lack of infrastructure for charging. So as the Biden administration works through the infrastructure bill, um, charging stations is gonna be a, a high topic on in the conversation, and that really needs to happen rapidly for the rest of the company to, I mean, the rest of the country to come along with purchasing electric vehicles and sticking with them. California has a lot of EVs, but if you come on my side of the, of the country in Georgia, you don't see that many. Um, so, and it's just a lack of, of lack of information, lack of knowledge, and a lack of infrastructure for charging. So, that's what I foresee happening. Thank you. Do we have any others? All right, well, I wanna thank Tiffany, Rustam, and Bobby for coming up here and sharing this wonderful knowledge with everybody, and uh, I believe this will conclude our panel discussion for today. Thank you all. Appreciate it.